Mostly, I'm not a person who focuses on past mistakes or regrets much. But someone asked me recently what regrets I'd had over my career over the past 40 odd years spent as a professional programmer. And it made me stop and think. So here are a few of my regrets over that time. Hi, I'm Dave Farley and welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. If you're new here, please do hit subscribe and support the channel. And if you enjoy our content today, hit like as well. So I've been extremely lucky in my career. I've got to do lots of interesting things. And so I don't really have any serious regrets about the way that my career's panned out. But nevertheless, I suppose like anyone, if I stop and think hard enough, I can find a few things that I wish had gone differently. For me, these things fell into two broad categories, general, I wish the world had turned out a little different and personal. I wish I'd done something or didn't do something that I did. So let's start with the general regrets. There have been several times in my career when I came across an idea or a technology that really resonated with me and I thought would change the world or at least the world of programming. One of those ideas that made me feel like that was object oriented design. It seemed to me such a rich, transformative way to think about and approach design. And I was convinced that it would change the world of programming for the better. I naively assumed that everybody would see what I thought that I saw in it and that it would make code easier to write and easier to read and would relegate the horrors of spaghetti code to history. How wrong could I be? Let me pause there and introduce our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, and Topple. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about here on the Modern Software Engineering channel every week. And they use those techniques to build great software for their clients. But all of these companies have a close relationship with the ideas that we talk about here every week. And so they build products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery or software engineering, do click on their links in the description below. I confess, I still believe that object orientation as a thinking and design approach was important and a big step forward. It gives us a richer model for organizing, navigating, and compartmentalizing our code and our thinking. And it's had a huge influence on our industry and on modern computing in general, I think. OO gave us more control over our ability to make change easier through modularity, cohesion, abstraction, and separation of concerns. At least it did that when we took advantage of it, meaning that we could more easily make change in one part of the code without affecting other parts. Of course, bad programming can limit the impact of any and all of these ideas, but it still seems to me such a powerful tool. Encapsulation is a good, fundamental programming idea, whether you're doing object orientation or not. But what really shocked me, what I regret, I suppose, is that still, even today, many programmers, even those programming with object-oriented languages, don't apply object-oriented thinking to their designs. Many don't even seem to recognize what that's about. OO really resonated with me, but in practice, I think that a lot of its value was missed by a lot of programmers. One of my favorite exercises when teaching test-driven development is to write code to add fractions. It brings in all sorts of different ideas that are worth exploring when we're teaching something. Almost no one though that I've ever taught has ever thought to start by creating a fraction class, which seems to me such an obvious starting point. That simplifies nearly everything, and to me at least, seemed almost impossible to miss. But nevertheless, he's still missed by nearly everyone who's ever started one of my live test-driven development courses. Most people start this problem by creating an add fraction function that takes strings as arguments to represent a fraction. Now you've got two problems, string parsing and adding fractions. I really don't get it. Isn't this obviously a better design choice than this? Okay. So I don't get it, but I do regret that object oriented thinking and design didn't become more common, more mainstream than it did, even though it did have a big impact on the world. It still seems to me to have so many benefits in terms of expressivity as a tool to help us to more effectively decompose and modularize our solutions. 
in fact, an effective tool for helping us to think in design terms. If you're interested in the ideas that we talk about here on the Modern Software Engineering Channel, we're about to start a new service. We've asked all of our presenters to suggest some useful pieces of advice to help you to improve your skills or to do a better job of software development. Sign up with the link in the description below and we'll send you a try today tip every day for at least the next month. Let us know what you think when you get them. My next general regret was the adoption or lack of adoption of test-driven development. I was deeply impressed the first time I tried test-driven development properly. I'd flirted with it a few times before, but once I did it properly, I was sold. And once again, wrongly, I assumed that all programming would be done like this in future. If I'm honest, I still think that that should be true. And now I do what I can to promote that idea. I regret that test-driven development isn't the norm, and I'm convinced that if it were, software development and software would be in a better shape than it is. If I had my way, when my grandchildren learned to program in kindergarten, they would learn with test-driven development first. It's that fundamental to me. If every programmer learned programming that way, software would be in much better shape and much cheaper to make. I won't rehearse all of my arguments for that too much here because I've talked about it many times on this channel before and there are other videos that you can check out. But I still feel sad that so many programmers and so many teams suffer so much from crappy code and so many organisations find it so difficult to change that crappy code and so many users, including me, have to put up with using crappy code like that that crashes all of the time and is so horrible to use that it makes software so frustrating to use for so much of the time. Enough of the generic regrets. Let's get a bit more personal, a bit more specific. I started my life as a programmer, as a hobbyist, writing code for fun, before it became my job. So I've written a lot of code over the years to do a lot of different things. Like most programmers making their own decisions on what to write, I mostly picked things that I wanted for myself or that I wanted to learn from, sometimes both. There were though a few things that I wish that I'd followed through properly. Things that I was always interested in, but never really made enough time for. I wish I'd done more open source development. I think I would have enjoyed it. The most successful open source project that I ever was personally involved in was the LMAX Disruptor, a mechanism for communicating at close to the hardware limits between threads of execution in very high performance systems. But I worked on and had ideas for a lot of other things that never got released. I never followed through enough to get those things finished enough to a standard where I could show them to other people. I love writing code, but I do find it hard to find the time to spend on it sometimes. In part, because once I dive in, I find it hard to surface again, usually for hours. So I find it hard to commit the large blocks of time that it takes me. I have an enjoyable, but busy life doing lots of other things. And I found it difficult to make time to follow through on my open source ideas which I certainly regret, but clearly not enough to better organize my time to make room for it. I've had a long, long had an interest also in distributed computing. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. And I built a lot of systems based on that kind of architecture. I was one of the authors for something called the Reactive Manifesto, which describes some of the details of the kind of actor-based approach that particularly interests me. You can see a video on that topic here. And every now and then, during the course of my interest in these sorts of distributed systems, someone would say to me, you should learn Erlang. And I should. I'm pretty sure that I would like it. The first time was when Ben, one of my friends and colleagues at ThoughtWorks, said he thought that I'd particularly like Erlang. That was 20 years ago now. I've downloaded the language several times and I've skimmed the tutorials several times. And I've even written, written small bits of code several times but I still haven't learned Erlang. I really wish that I had. I love the idea of the Beam, the platform that optimizes, amongst other things, interactor communications. So that if you don't care if the call ends up happening at runtime on the same machine or communicating between actors across the planet. I like the simple programming model of only messages between actors, no shared state other than via messages, and the supervisor system for managing faults when they happen. I met Joe Armstrong, Erlang's creator, a couple of times and once spent a, a lovely day with him at a conference 
where we and a couple of other people spent the whole day talking to each other instead of attending the conference. He was a fascinating and very opinionated man. I liked Joe a lot and was very committed to learning Erlang after the day that I spent with him. And still, I didn't make it. Damn. For my final, slightly more general, maybe existential regret, is that regret how the internet has turned out a little bit so far. For the generation of people that came a bit later, this is probably going to sound naive and maybe a little bit weird, but you have to imagine what the world was like before the internet was widely available. There was no instant easy access to information. If you wanted to learn something, you had to exercise your memory, buy a book or find someone to teach you. None of that looking up an actor whose name you can't remember or the date of a song when it was released. If you couldn't remember it and your friends couldn't remember it, you probably weren't going to find out. I was a pretty early adopter of the internet and I suppose something of an internet idealist. I had one of the first £10 per month dial-up accounts with Demon in the UK. So not quite the first wave of internet users in academia, but firmly in the second wave of enthusiasts. I can remember having a conversation with a relative who was a professional software developer who had never heard of the internet in those days. This was during the mid-1990s. I thought that the promise of the internet was phenomenal. How wonderful I imagined if everyone could have access to everything. Think about how amazing it would be if you could find any piece of music, any movie, any TV program, any book, any scientific paper. Imagine being able to publish your ideas to the whole world at the push of a button. I imagined all of these ideas. Think how much better educated, better informed we'd all be if the world was like that. Think how it would break down barriers between people if there were no barriers of communication between us. Wouldn't that be amazing? And it is. And it was. But there are consequences of all of this freedom that I didn't think about then. Now, people with crazy ideas can spread them so that we have the rise of flat earthers and other conspiracy theorists all over the internet. I think that the internet is a wonderful, but also a rather complex and untrustworthy place. In my naivety, I'd hoped for something better. The idea that anyone with a phone and an internet connection can access, in essence, the whole of human knowledge is a remarkable one, as well as all of that. We're also flooded, though, with often meaningless choices. Now that I can access any music ever made, pretty much, by almost anyone in the world, I don't listen to music as much as I used to. Maybe that's my age, maybe it's the music, maybe it's just that I'm overwhelmed by the level of choice that I've got now. I could go on and on and be, and be miserable about this, but that's not what I mean to be saying. This isn't about me just shouting at the world. What I really mean is that the internet is an amazing, fantastic thing. But we humans quickly became both addicted to it and disillusioned by it. There are certainly wonderful things about our modern access to information. But I was naive and it didn't work out quite as I imagined. The internet has become a dark and complex place, as well as a liberating and wonderful one. I once hoped for a bit more of the latter and a bit less of the former than we ended up with in reality. Hence my sense of regret. Let us know your big regrets about the progress of software in the comments. It'll be fascinating to see what you find frustrating and challenging. Thank you very much for watching. And if you have watched this far, thank you for watching all the way to the end. And why not consider supporting our channel further by joining us as a Patreon member? I'd also like to take this opportunity as usual to say thank you to all of our Patreon members because you help us to, to do this work on the channel. Thank you very much indeed for your support.